Awesome. Here we go. I am now recording. And uh, let me just really quickly remind you that when we were talking about um, Russian art last time, we were talking a lot about the itinerants, which was um, an artist movement uh, that appeared in Russia in the second half of the 19th century. And the itinerance was a phenomenon that was very similar to what was happening in art um, in different parts of Europe, right? Um, all over Europe, the uh, national schools started appearing and artists sort of started to rebel against uh, the Academy of Fine Arts, where number one, uh, you know, stories from ancient mythology, stories from the Bible, uh, or maybe ancient history were really dominant. Another thing, uh, okay, I'm also gonna mute everybody real quick. Um, and then also, um, the other thing about the itinerants is that um, um, they wanted to show the life around them. So what really dominated in uh, the art of the itinerants is showing uh, their country, their country's history, and the life around them. A lot of uh, the itinerant art was um, centered around social problems, but in general, regardless of, of what genre they chose to take on, um, they put their own spin on it. And last time we started talking a little bit about the historic genre. And today, before we move on to other genres, I wanted to give you a couple more examples of uh, the historic genre. I'm just gonna quickly check the uh, chat. Um, okay, everything is good. Um, so this painting at Tretikov Gallery uh, right here is quite remarkable. Uh, right in front of us is the painting that is called Princess Tarakanova. A uh, Princess Tarakanova is um, a story from 18th century Russian history. And actually it's not uh, entirely a true story. This painting is based on an adventure novel um, that in turn is based on 18th century Russian history. In 19th century, those adventure history novels became very popular. And basically the story behind Princess Tarakanova, who you can see here in the painting, um, is the story of an imposter. So this adventurous lady who wants to have it all uh, decides to take, a, take advantage of the era of palace coups um, in the history of Russian monarchy where you know, our monarchs were interchanging really quickly. Um, and so she poses herself um, as one of the descendants of the royal family and the rightful heir to the throne. And um, actually, she doesn't even want to uh, have the Russian throne. She actually just wants to shine in Europe and she wants to have some mysterious history behind her. But when Russian monarchs find out that there is this lady in Europe who's talking about being uh, the heir to the Russian throne, um, they decide that they need to get rid of her or at least take care of it. Um, so uh, one of Russian uh, most handsome aristocrats gets sent to France to grab her, seduce her, bring her back to Russia, where he promises her all the riches that she would have access to the throne and uh, would be treated so well in Russia. So she agrees. She follows this man all the way to Russia, only to find that when she uh, gets off the ship, she gets arrested for trying to attempt to capture the Russian crown. And um, uh, here she is depicted in a cell in Peter and Paul's fortress, uh, Russia's number one political prison in the 18th century. Um, and actually at the moment of her death, 
um, the myth had it that Princess Tarakanova died during a flood. As you might know, in St. Petersburg, um, before the dam was constructed, the number one cataclysm was floods. And the, uh, the story was that she died in her cell during one of the floods. And here you can see her in this really dramatic moment of her death. Um, the window of her cell is in the corner and there is water starting starting to go into the cell. And even though, um, as you can imagine, being a political prisoner in the 18th century was not the fanciest thing ever. She was probably just confined to a cell um, with mice and very simple food. Um, the artist uh, whose last name was Flavitsky certainly um, idealizes her. Just even the way that he depicts her, the pose um, that she has in the painting is very sensual. And, you know, the dress she's wearing is really beautiful. If the story was even true, she certainly would not be wearing anything even close to that. But this is, uh, you know, uh, the image of this um, adventurous woman and a beautiful prisoner confined to the four walls of a cell in the fortress uh, that is about to die in this very dramatic way. So, uh, so far, the depictions of Russian history that we saw in the paintings of the itinerants were very um, dramatic, very harsh in a way. Um, I think maybe trying to show the sad and the ugly pages of Russian history, while very dramatic, I must admit. Um, but here we have, um, you know, sort of a very adventurous, beautiful take on um, Russian history here, uh, taking this beautiful story. Anyways, uh, I would say that this painting by Flavitsky really stands out uh, because it doesn't take on the grimmest subjects and even wants to make the grim things look beautiful. Uh, a much better illustration of how the itinerants liked to depict scenes from Russian history is uh, this painting. It's called Dyarinya Morozova by uh, the artist whose name was, uh, last name was Surikov. Uh, Surikov loved different stories from Russian history, and after this one, we'll look at another one. Um, this lady, who we see in the center of the painting on a sled pulled by a horse, uh, her name was Bayarina Morozova or Princess Morozova, and she was an old believer um, in the um, 17, uh, late 17th century. Um, the old believers were Orthodox Christians who believed that uh, the moder modernization of the Orthodox Church um, were sinful. And really, that those most of the things, most of the changes that took place in the Orthodox Church were relatively small. But um, when I explained to my guests from overseas what old believers were, I think the closest um analogy we can find is maybe the Amish community in the US. Um, so the old believers um, renounced any sort of progress uh, that could happen in life. They lived in really close communities and denied any sort of technological progress and they wanted to um, be self-sufficient and in general stay further away from the world. And throughout the history of the Russian monarchy, different Russian monarchs treated the old believers differently. Some of them absolutely left them alone and believed that the old believers should live their own life um, and practice their religion the way they thought was best, while some other monarchs persecuted the old believers and um, believed that there was only one way uh, to live in the Orthodox Church. And so Bayarina Marozova was um, one of the most passionate old believers who practiced that religion even though it was forbidden. And um, she was quite a rich lady, right? She was a princess, Princess Marozova, uh, but she chose to renounce also all of her wealth. And she spent some time hiding underground in uh, one of 
um, the relatives' houses because she was hiding from the persecutors. One day, Princess Marozova was found and she was arrested uh, uh, together with some other old believers um, and taken away uh, and imprisoned. And this is the moment uh, that Surikov shows in his painting. You can see Princess Marozova on a sleigh. There is a really thin, beautiful chain going from one of her wrists to the other. Um, and a sleigh is pulling her away. And this, I think, is an incredibly powerful picture. There are so many really powerful images in it. Number one, I'm going to zoom in a little bit on the face of Princess Marozova because Surikov, uh, Vasily Surikov, uh, wanted to show um, a face of a true fanatic, as he himself explained. Uh, just look at this incredibly pale face, eyes, mad with passion and uh it's hard to tell um what exactly her attitude is to the rest of the crowd probably she maybe she's cursing them um maybe she's just making a very passionate uh religious uh speech about the nature of the old believers it, it is hard to tell but you can certainly tell there is a lot of passion in this face um Another really powerful thing about this painting is just all the contrasts um, that we see. Number one, uh, when we see the contrast between uh, the princess and her outfit, uh, this dark black dress and this um, headpiece that is covering her head entirely, and this incredibly bright crowd of peasants and other city folk that just all run out of their houses to watch her get persecuted and, um, you know, dragged away in the sled. It's a wonderful contrast. And even the composition that Surikov chooses for this painting also adds more to this contrast. Um, the sleigh is just crashing into the crowd, dividing it into two halves. Um, this is also a metaphor for how our uh, orthodox faith was also divided. We even call it uh, the great break in the religion uh, when people separated into the old believers and the new believers. So the, the sled itself with the princess going in it um, is breaking the society in half in a way. Um, another contrast we can see is between, again, the face of Princess Morozova and the face of this um, man in the corner who is probably what we call a fool for christ uh so it's like a religious man maybe um a little bit insane uh preaching christianity on the streets we can see it's really cold out but he's wearing a very light shirt and no shoes and he is um, crossing her, he is blessing her um, onto the journey uh, that she is about to take on. Just a simple, just a simple person on the street, also quite powerful. Finally, I want to draw your attention just to the view of the street itself in this painting. Uh, art critics believe that there are there are more than ten shades of. Uh, color that Surikov uses to de uh, to depict snow, uh, which is such an important part of our Russian nature and the Russian landscape. So I think it is it is true that when the itinerants wanted to draw their attention to the Russian subjects, they encompassed it all: um, the society, the stories, and even the landscape as well. Another painting uh, by Surikov uh, that is very famous and is also um, from the Tretikov Gallery is called Morning of the Execution of the Strelci. Strelci means, um, is, if you literally translate this word, means um, arrow shooters. And this was a big division of the army um, in ancient Russia. Um, uh, started, you know, um, a long time ago. And uh, the strelci or the, you know, the shooters were a very important part of the Russian army. Uh, they were also um, quite a high class of people that were pretty well paid by the government because they provided protection for the government in itself. They provided a very strong army force. Um, however, the Strelci were not always treated really well um, by different monarchs. For example, they were allowed, um, uh, they were supposed to be provided a certain allowance 
Um, and sometimes the Russian czars generously gave that allowance, sometimes they didn't. And sometimes when there were any power struggle in the Russian government, um, the Strelitsy would, uh, you know, uh, um, align themselves with one or the other ruler. Anyways, um, in the early years of the rule of Peter the Great, um, there was a big riot of the Strelitsy uh, because of, they weren't treated really fairly. Um, they were kept in the dark. They didn't know all the information, they were not given their allowance, and eventually the Strelitsy decided to revolt. As a result of it, um, a fair amount of them were sentenced to death, and the morning of that execution is what's depicted in the painting. Those of you who have been to Moscow might be able to recognize uh, the Red Square, which is where uh, the uh, picture takes place. Um, and you might even be able to recognize some of the characters. Uh, let me zoom in to the right. This right here is Peter the Great, the ruler who chose to execute um, these soldiers. And right next to him, are uh, a group of people that looks like visitors from abroad. Um, just like the previous painting we saw, this one is also a lot about the contrast. We can see the big group of the soldiers and their families on the left, and quite a small group of uh, Peter the Great and other aristocrats on the right. And there is a little road uh, that divides them. In a way, here we can see a big contradiction between the society and the power, the society and the government, um, the different emotions and even the positions of them uh, that we can see in the painting also tell, tell us a lot. Um, the crowd of soldiers, all look, uh, most of them look very emotional. A lot of them are crying. Uh, members of their families are certainly crying. Um, when Peter the Great is just on a horse, and really um, the look on his face is quite an angry one. He is angry at these at these people. In fact, we know for sure who he's looking at. It's this gentleman on the left. He has an angry look, um, and Peter the Great is looking back at him. So. Uh, he is meeting his angry look with this uh, similarly angry response. So um, it's amazing how this painting develops from uh, left to right, from bottom to top, uh, you know, uh, from the people to the landscape. But art critics believe that there is also the um, dimension of time uh, that is shown in his painting as well. And we are supposed to look at this painting from left to right and see the progression in time of one soldier who is about to be executed. Uh, let me illustrate what I'm trying to say. Um, if we look at the soldier on the left who is sitting in the car, um, we can't tell exactly what he's doing. Maybe he's resting. Uh, maybe he is um, just in deep thought. But we certainly don't see a lot of despair in his face. We don't see his face in, at all, in fact. Then um, if we go from left to right, it really shows us the progression of this person who is about to get executed. The next stage of it is anger. And again, we see the, the soldier angrily looking at Peter the Great. Um, there is some sort of denial um, here in the center as the bearded soldier is looking at the ground. Um, maybe trying to understand what is about to happen to him, same as this uh, soldier with white hair and white beard. The soldier standing up, um, our critics believe is maybe um, saying goodbye to the rest of the crowd, uh, is making amends, and is definitely realizing what is about to happen as he looks quite devastated in here. And finally, the last soldier already is being taken away to be executed. And so we see this whole process from maybe resting in the car to uh, being led to an execution. And um, we also see that each of the uh, soldiers is holding a lit candle. Uh, one, two, three, four. Um, this one, we don't know if he's holding a candle or not, but that also kind of Kind of shows us the progress as for, if we go from left to right 
the candle flame is getting smaller and smaller. Another interesting thing to take note of is the people surrounding the soldiers, their families. Um, some of them have their wives that are weeping <clears throat> right next to them with looks of despair. Um, this soldier's wife, for example, is uh, sitting on the floor and you can see a candle um, on the ground um, that this has been put out here another woman crying uh, but i think one of the most dramatic uh, images in this painting is this little girl um here surikov um is can so beautifully contrast her bright clothes um which are so typical for russian attire uh, uh this purple shirt crimson red um a scarf on her head and just the look on her face is just a look of horror and confusion um, that a child I think in the artist's view is not supposed to experience really and um, that in, in, in also can be contrasted just the rest of the landscape here we can see it's kind of like a dull fall morning the gray sky the dirty ground of the square you know this was way before um, any of this got paved and all together uh, i think this creates a very very powerful image that is so full of uh different symbols that i think is quite remarkable um but moving on, um, I want to talk to you about um, some other genres. Uh, before I do that, I just wanted to show you one more time uh, the pictures of all of these um, shooters here so that you can see them a little bit closer and look at their facial expressions. And Surikov is such a talented portraitist here in such a big historic painting. He shows the faces of all of these men. Uh, the portrait genre um, also uh, took quite a spin with the itinerants. Uh, and I want to show you one of the most famous portraits of that era uh, that is known as um the stranger or the unknown lady um as we call her uh in russia it's one of the most famous paintings at the tretikov gallery and it was created by ivan kramskoy who was um the mastermind behind the itinerance movement nowadays i think uh, an average russian views this painting as a portrait of a beautiful lady lavishly clothed um she's wearing leather gloves uh, there's a uh, fur um adorning her jacket it looks like her fancy hat has some something like an ostrich feather in it just a beautiful fancy lady. However, uh, the contemporaries of Ivan Kramskoy um, and Tretikov, who was the collector here at the Tretikov Gallery, understood that this is not just a simple lady. Uh, it probably is a woman of easy virtue, so to say, um, a woman possibly with a good education, young and beautiful, uh, a mistress of some powerful man. And uh, when Tretikov um, saw this painting, he refused to buy it because he believed it to be quite immoral. But uh, we have to say that while he didn't love the painting personally, he had enough of a gift to understand uh, the meaning that the painting would have for his collection. And even though personally he didn't like it, um, he, he ended up purchasing it anyway. So now it is one of the most beautiful portraits in the Tretikov gallery. Uh, of course, the landscape genre also had a lot to offer. And I also want to offer you one of the most famous Russian landscape painters here. Uh, his last name was Shishkin. Uh, 
And the word shishka in Russian means a pine cone, which is was just so perfect because Shishkin loved to paint uh, forest landscapes. He was an exceptional student of the Academy of Fine Arts. Uh, he was one of those pensioner students, which means when he graduated, he got a special award and what got sent abroad to Germany, to be precise, to study art there. But rumor has it that when Shishkin was in Germany, he couldn't wait to go back to his beloved motherland. Uh, that's much. That's how much he loved Russia and Russian nature. Um, he also was really a true master of his craft. Uh, and uh, Shishkin's contemporaries said that he was just really good at looking at nature and envisioning the best way to frame the view that he sees in front of him. So for example, when he would go to the open air and see several trees, sometimes he even had a pair of scissors with him and he would cut off uh, some imperfect little branches, uh, put away some things that shouldn't be in the painting so that in his um, works, Russian nature uh, could be shown at its absolute best. Uh, and you can see uh, his probably most famous piece um, here uh, from the Tretikov Gallery. Uh, the painting is called The Morning in the Pine Forest. And what we can see here, first of all, is a gorgeous forest. And Shishkin knew um, all the different kinds of trees, different uh, all the differences between uh, different kinds of fir trees. And um, art critics even say that um, biologists and botanists uh, that were Shishkin's contemporaries would say that from his paintings, you, you could put a, a, a botanical encyclopedia next to his paintings um, and just put the two and two together. He was just so precise in the way that he uh, depicted nature. And uh, on top of the beautiful nature uh, that Shishkin depicts here, he puts these playful little bears uh, having fun in the forest and climbing the trees. Even then, uh, this painting was incredibly popular, but it gained its true popularity in the 20th century um, when it became, um, when it became the face of one of Russia's most uh, famous kinds of candy. We call it, um, uh, we, we call it just bears. Um, and yeah, every Russian person knows uh, this beautiful painting. Um, another interesting example of Russian landscape uh, that I wanna show you here uh, is this piece called Rooks Have Arrived by Alexei Savrasov. When you look at the piece, it looks incredibly unremarkable. Um, you know, there, there's some dirt, there is snow that is about to melt, the trees are completely bare. And if you look at this painting with maybe a subjective eye, analytical eye, it's really hard to tell what's so beautiful about it. However, apparently for a typical Russian, and it was true in the 19th century, and it is true to this day, our heart just uh, immediately uh, starts beating faster when we look at this piece, because for us, it means the spring is coming. When we look at this piece, and even now I'm looking at it and it makes me feel so happy because the snow is melting, the rooks have arrived back uh, from warmer places, and it means that spring is coming soon. And um, this was another wonderful example of an artist who chose to depict beautiful Russian nature and um, just really hit the spot uh, with all the Russian people. It's so wonderful. Finally, one last landscape uh, that I want to show you is by an, uh, the artist whose name was Isaac uh, Levitan. Um, and uh, this painting is called Over Eternal Quiet. Um, again, a wonderful contrast between a small church on a little island that in a way symbolizes uh, humankind, human thoughts, um, 
and the rest of the world that has so much to offer, that is so unexplored, uh, that is just so much more for us to comprehend. A simple landscape with a big river and a little island and an old church and a cemetery, uh, but just uh, so much uh, itself from it. So that, uh, we just talked about some examples of um, uh, portraits, some examples of beautiful landscapes. Um, but I still have a lot to share with you. Social genre, other artists beyond the itinerants, uh, but because of our technical difficulties today um, and having to switch to Zoom, I wouldn't be able to cover a lot more. And I certainly uh, will be scheduling another talk to talk about Russian art because I still have so much more to tell you. But I also want to provide you a chance to ask me questions. I can see with the Zoom abilities, I have like um, six minutes remaining uh, to tell you, uh, to talk to you today. So I do wanna give you an opportunity to ask me some questions. Uh, so please feel free to type them in the chat or because we are a small group, you can absolutely unmute yourself and ask. Um, and while you do that, I just really want to thank you for being so flexible today, switching to Zoom with us. Um, I am recording this and I will share it on the channel. Um, and I definitely will make sure there is a way for me to make up for um, the wait time that you had today. All right, uh, while you're typing, I just want to share briefly about what's in store for us. Uh, there is still a little bit more of the itinerance. I want to talk to you about genre scenes and their social realism. And then after that, I want to dive um, into um, the movement of art uh, that is called um, the world of art movement just incredible, incredibly beautiful art and it's considered to be sort of the uh, source from which the Russian avant-garde um, stems and then of course Russian avant-garde as well. So um, definitely, I will definitely cover that. I'm very excited to be sharing that with you and I see some questions in the chat so let me check that out. I see one message. I'm surprised that the beautiful woman who was depicted was assumed to be a woman with moral issues. Were there uh, other indicators? Um, great question. Um, oh. How can we know she's a woman with moral issues? Um, I guess it's the frivolous way in which she was dressed, number one. Number two, this, I guess one thing I omitted in my story is that this was a picture of a particular woman <laughs> who we knew was a mistress of a powerful man. Um, and uh, the artist managed to depict the facial expression of um, self understanding your self-worth, a certain pride uh, really well. And I guess the contemporaries didn't love that. Um. <laughs> yes. Um, well, uh, thank you so much again for joining me today. I again want to thank you for your flexibility. Um, and I promise uh, to make the next month's presentation um, work. We'll make sure the software works. So thanks for checking the comments. If you have any more questions, feel free to email me. And um, as I said, uh, this uh, this recording will be saved and shared. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I will see you next month. Bye, everybody.